Hey there. So my next guest has a company focused on the health and wellness space in the gaming industry. And what I love about this interview is he's a serial entrepreneur and he discusses his journey. He talks about the ups and the downs and some of the things he tried that worked that didn't work or didn't try that did work. And it's a very interesting look at a, a true entrepreneur who kind of found their way into the gaming space. So I know you all are going to love this one. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Gamerpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Bradford Carlton. Today, I have a very special guest with us. I have Dana Paul DiPaolo. Hey there, Dana. How's it going? It's going fantastic. How are you today? It is a beautiful sunny day in Las Vegas. How about yourself? Uh, well, it's a beautiful, sunny, cold day in New England. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I, I try not to think of the cold anymore. I did nine years in it. <laughs> All yeah, right. That's so. a smart thing. So, uh, Dana, I like getting the show just started right into it, no fluff. Why don't you begin by just telling us a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, so um, a serial entrepreneur, um, kind of been um, doing startups, I think, ever since I got out of college, which I won't date how long ago that is, um, up until this most recent one, which is uh, Ritual Motion, which is probably, out of all the things I've done, is pretty much led up to this point in Ritual Motion and um really excited about it just everything we got going on and what we're doing with it and like i said all the lessons learned um in the past all the kind of things you had where you stumbled and the challenges those are all great things you learn and you move forward and it kind of builds up to you know this venture right now absolutely all right i'm looking forward to hearing about your history talking about ritual motion but before we do that I start every interview with a single question. So I'm going to ask you, just like I ask everybody else, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being high, how weird are you, Dana? Um, I'd probably say a nine. <laughs> a nine? Why is that? Uh, uh, well, you know, weird in the sense that I don't think I'm weird, but I think the fact that um, I tend to be more of an extrovert, um, you know, I don't mind solitude, don't mind, you know, I'm the type of person who I'll go and have you know, lunch by myself. I, I, I kind of like that, um, quality, um, where you can kind of just sit in and absorb everything around you. Okay. So you're an extrovert who likes peace and quiet. Yes. Okay. Exactly. That's where you get the nine from. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Okay. Now, Dana, this is the Gamerpreneur podcast. So before we get to any of the business stuff, I do need your gaming cred. When did you first start playing video games? Um, you know, listen, it's going to go way back, but my, I'll never forget my first gaming console was Pong. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And we would play for hours. And it's, you know, when you think about it, it was so simple at the time where you had basically it was, you either played tennis or they had kind of like a little hockey one where you'd play. And, but that was it. it went from Kong to ColecoVision um, to Atari and just kind of going from there. That that is pretty old school. All right, now, what do you play today, if anything? Um, I really like today. I like playing because my kids are really into Smash, so I really enjoy Smash. Um, and I I still enjoy some old school. Last week I played for a couple of days Spyro. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it was just kind of really fun. I, I like going back and just going through my kids' kind of their little library and collections, pull out and on an old system, pull out a, you know, game and just play something that I haven't played in a really long time. All right. Who's your go-to character in Smash then? Um, I like Kirby. Kirby. Why is that? Um, I like the different, uh, first of all, he's so, (laughs) when you look at all the Smash characters, Kirby was probably like last to be picked last for dodgeball and gym class, right? (laughs) When you compare to some of the other Mario, Luigi, you know, I, I just like the fact that he can do certain things. He kind of floats up there in the air, comes down, and he, and he and he's silent, but he yet let has a lot of power to him. <laughs> All right, I won't make any jokes about silent but deadly, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, um, now Dana, you have had the entire gamut of games, you know, from the original Pong all the way to today. If you had to pick one game as your all-time favorite, which one would it be? So it's going to be once again going back to your first question of why I rated it. There was a computer game called Mist that was out. And it was one of the first games that you really had to do puzzle solving. 
um, through these kind of little worlds. And you could spend a day on a level. And if you missed one clue, one little element, you, you couldn't go through and you had to backtrack. So I love that aspect of it where they actually was the first game that I ever got where they gave you a notebook because you needed to take, I don't know if you remember this, but you actually needed to take notes and there were clues and things you had to solve, riddles, and it, it all led up to getting to that next level. So that that was one of my favorite games because it kept me so engaged. Um, and, and really you had to, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't keep your mind off of it. You know, you had to keep on going. I'd wake up at night and go turn the computer back on because I remembered I didn't do something in a certain area, you know, and I was like, oh, that's why I couldn't get past that level. So I Could like you that. imagine if a game like that came out today? I don't think anybody would be willing to take the notes. It's all just on the internet already. I, I Well, I think, yeah, I think <laughs> that's right. We didn't really have the internet when when Miss came out. So yeah, now you'd you'd be able to go on Reddit and find all the little kind of, cheat sheets all the if there were easter eggs all of that would be right there at your disposal for sure okay let's get over to the preneur part because that's what we're really here for um could you begin by telling us a little bit about your professional background how did you end up at ritual motion yeah so i I, like i said i've always kind of been a serial entrepreneur originally i was going to when i was in undergrad i had this thought of like hey i want to become a lawyer thought it'd be kind of really interesting and My parents seemed to really love that idea. But when I graduated um, my senior year, I was really, I took a complete shift. And I went from thinking about law school to um, I wanted to pursue a career in photography. I love the whole concept of photography, the medium, um, the fact that as soon as you take a picture, everything changes, right? Like it's almost like a time machine. Um, so I ended up pursuing that a little bit, but in, in, and that was really one of my first lessons where you had to be kind of an entrepreneur. Cause you basically had to learn how to market yourself, right? You learned how to ha- be able to pick up the phone. Cause back then you actually picked up the phone to talk to people <laughs> and get clients. So that kind of got my wheels going, um, in a more formative way, right? Everybody has a story of they had their own lemonade stand or, you know, a uh, paper route. Sure. I, did all that. But I, I say that was at the point where the rubber started really hitting the road like, oh, okay, you're going to market. How do you market? How do you, so you'd read books on marketing, right? Or, you know, you try to go and get information on how to market yourself better. How do you, how do you get your craft? So it helped you kind of build all, all of those things, building blocks um, to move forward. Okay. Um, so you went from photographer to ritual motion or how? No, 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 no. So I went from, um, it's a great question. I went from photographer to, in um, 1998, um, started with two friends of mine. We started a digital agency called Shazam. So in high school, I was really into programming. Back then, the language of choice was basic. So a lot of your readers or viewers right now probably have no idea what basic is, but um it was just a really simple language, right? Line statements, uh, if to go to sort of things like that. So I had a Commodore 64 um, when I was in high school, built a database um, for pizza places in my neighborhood because every Friday night would be pizza night. And my parents, we'd always sit around the table and say, okay, what pizza place do we want to charge out? So that was kind of my interlude of programming, which I loved. I love the idea of, you know, having this language in, um, using that language to create a machine to do something. Um, so fast forward to 1998, the web was getting big. Um, I was still at that point doing photography, loving the medium of that, but I love the medium of what the web had to bring. So got together with two good friends of mine. One was a graphic designer. One was an illustrator, RISD guys. And we basically, I said, let's just do a web development company, but let's, let's have art dictate what the back end is because programming was just zeros and ones right as opposed to people are trying to have the back end dictate what the user experience would be so we created a company called shazam um got very lucky right place right time we landed espn as our first client and uh we were the record of uh, agency of record for them for things like x games sps great outdoor games and we went from three guys literally in a living room in Providence to um, we were probably about 20 people, I'd say about eight months after that. Um, 
built up that company, had a lot of fun, um, learned a lot about marketing, about you know business development, client relationships, how important it is, and the key about um, creating a great relationship with your client. And if you're going to do something, you do it. Um, sold the company in 2008 to one of um, one of my clients who wanted to bring it um, and have that kind of aspect of a, a digital agency under their umbrella. Stayed on with them for three years um, as part of my obligation. Left there, wasn't really sure what I was going to do. And then I got um, tapped to come in and work with this company called Alex and Ani and to run their innovation lab. So it was really interesting because that was really one of the first times I ever worked for a company. Um, and it was neat because in the innovation lab, was able to work with technology, which I love, and problem solving with the marketing team and products. So we were starting to go down the path of wearables and things like that. This is 2011, 2012, 2013, 14. Um, which is a really good time. Alex and Ani at the time when I started with them, they were around $4 million a year in sales. When I left, they were about $300 million a year in sales. Oh, good job. So <laughs> um, that was a real, that was kind of a real fun, fun time. And, and in between Shazam and Alex and Ani, I don't want to leave things out. I, I started an energy drink company um, just because I wanted to understand how do you bring a, an idea to market to consumer and energy drink was a pretty easy one to do because it was a beverage company in my town that did white labeling. So they did bottling for folks. So it was a really cool experiment of seeing how you get an idea, how you formulate that idea, and can you actually bring it to market. And the goal with my energy drink company was just to get one convenience store to buy it. Um, ended up getting pretty lucky, um, built the company up, had about eight employees, and then ended up selling it to a distributor in Brooklyn, um, a Red Boat distributor. So they ended up buying the company. After that, I also did a peanut butter company um, called Sinagro, which is organic spelled backwards. Uh, but we were the first peanut butter that actually put protein in it. So now you have a great, it's a good category. You have folks that are already doing that. So once again, I had my partner, he was a nutritionist. He came to me with the concept. I understood kind of the marketing side of it from there. Um, and our goal, once again, our goal for me was Whole Foods. I wanted to get in a couple of Whole Foods. We ended up in 38 Whole Foods from Maine all the way down to New Jersey. Um, ended up selling the company. So it's all those little things. Consumer products are really fun because I love having this thing of how do you tap into the consumer's psyche, right? How do you get a consumer to actually pull that off the shelf, look at it and say, wow, this is really cool. I want to buy it. Right. Um, yeah. And it was all those building blocks that kind of led me to where we are now with ritual motion. That's absolutely incredible. What an amazing journey. Now, please tell us what is ritual motion? Yeah. So ritual motion is a um, it's a, a content media hub that focuses on health, wellness and education with a with their kind of leaders in health, wellness and education and gaming and in esports. Um our mantra is from day one has always been authenticity, inclusion, and diversity. We don't do anything if we can't check off those boxes. But what, what Ritual Motion has become is a place where you, you get creators who can collaborate and then share that information. So right now, our medium is if um, we have someone like yourself, you may be interviewed by Crystal Mills, right? That's the creation and collaboration part. And then we share that information in different mediums. We may share that information in the print form. We may share that information in a podcast. We may share that information actually in a video. We have a thing called RMTV. So we have different channels uh, being able to share that information and um um, not to be a Steve Jobs with, you know, kind of building hype up, but we have something really massive happening in April that I can't tell you about now that we've created a platform that's going to be the first of its kind that's going to allow creative content folks to collaborate and connect and to share. Very cool. Okay. Dan, you, you have done so much. You've done so many incredible things. So what is your role with Ritual Motion? What is it you do day to day? Um, day to day, my goal is really, I, I always say my goal is to support the team. I have 
just the most incredible team, myself and my co-founder. My co-founder is a, also a serial entrepreneur. Um, he's done about 50 companies. He's had the opportunity to have a unicorn. He was one of the co-founders of Teespring, um, which went from zero to a billion dollar valuation in 24 months. He's got a medical background. So really, our my goal is A, to support um, it, Bill and, and thoughts and ideas he has and to make sure I execute on those. Um, but all most importantly is, you know, to support what I call our Navy SEAL team. We have by far the best team in the industry. And my goal day to day is to support them, making sure I can help drive whatever it is they need to get across the goal line. Okay, beautiful. Um, what makes you good at that? Because, you know, leadership takes something different than the, the people, the troops on the ground, right? It takes different qualities and skills and talents. What what makes you good at this? I, you know, I think what really helped me along the way is from an every, from a really early stage, learning and understanding mindfulness, right? So you say, what does mindfulness have to do with leadership? What does mindfulness have to do with entrepreneurism? Mindfulness helps you understand doing things with intentional actions, right? It's not just an accident. It's not just, oh, this is just going to happen. So I think what's helped me from along the way from all the successes I've had and, and also the failures. And failure is not a bad thing. Failure is actually a blessing that we get because we can learn from it, right? Is this whole concept of being mindful, understanding and have situation awareness of A, what your team is going through, which is the most important thing, and how to make sure you're there for them and to support them, and also you know, how to keep on driving the business, how to keep on moving forward. Okay. Um, now, my show is about advice for my audience, right? I, I'm hoping that someone out there listening to you goes, wow, his background is so incredible, but maybe I, I'm not able to accomplish the same things he has. But that's not necessarily true because it just takes a good mentor. What advice would you have for a, a new entrepreneur out there looking to grow and, and develop something? I would just say you have to a, believe in yourself and believe in the idea, <laughs> right? If, if you don't, are not fully committed into the idea, then maybe that's not the idea you need to do to move forward. It has to be a complete commitment. Now, that doesn't mean that believing in self and believing idea, you're going to end up becoming a unicorn. You, you may go six months with that and learn an incredible amount. And then now there may be something new that takes you to that next level. But it has to start with self-belief. Right. And we all can do anything we really set our minds and our attentions to as long as we keep it within the realms of possibilities. Right. Listen, I would love to be, uh, you know, a quantum physicist. Right. But I just know it's not in the realm of possibility for what my skill set is and what I'm passionate really about. Right. I love reading about quantum physics. I love seeing shows on it. But it, it's keeping everything into perspective and understand that. Really, it's all about visualization too, right? So they, they teach that a lot. I know in the military and a lot, like even with Navy SEALs, is like visualizing what you want that outcome to be, right? And not just broad stroke, but, but continuously visualizing, setting your intentions, setting your mind, right? Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. Tom Brady, right? Just won another Super Bowl. What people probably don't know is – couple of weeks before that Super Bowl, he was constantly emailing his, uh, texting his teammates around 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night saying, we will win. Not only was he putting that out there, but he was explaining to them why they would win, right? We would win because the Chiefs have a really poor defense when it comes down to second down. And here's what we would need to do. And then he would call out certain players and give them examples of how they would win and why they would win. And he did that up until the literally game day, right? And if you remember when he held up the trophy, he looked over the team and he said, you know, you guys, are, you shouldn't be surprised, right? Because they knew in their mind, they knew before that game even started, they were going to win that game. And I think that's the same thing. Even if you're a small one-person startup, you have to have that constant kind of affirmation with yourself and, and that mindfulness and understand that there's going to be days where you're going to get knocked down, 
And folks who get knocked down and stay down, well, they're not going to move forward. It's when you get back up, you learn and you say, oh, I'm going to go it again. And you may get knocked down 200 more times, but you keep on going. I love it. That is beautiful. I, I want to get a little more granular, granular on a point you had just made, though. You said you need to take stock of what you're good at, but also what you're not good at. That way you can go off and find other people who might be able to supplement that. H- how would somebody go off and say that? For, for example, I'm not the best salesperson in the world. I'm, I'm the visionary. I'm the one who can do the leadership thing. But you get me in front of someone, I'm more likely to just give away the farm than try to sell them. Like, How would someone go and find that that person who has that skill or quality that they're lacking? Hey, that's a great question. So it, it starts really simple, self-awareness, right? Be aware of what you're really good at and own it. You know, we have in this, it's really interesting in our culture is we don't focus to necessarily on our strengths, right? We try to learn a skill set that you've never learned before. So I'm going to go back to, to Tom Brady again when he was at the Patriots, right? Bill Belichick never said to Tom Brady, learn how to kick a football. What did he say? Be better at throwing the ball, throwing the ball, throwing the ball. And that starts with ourself, right? So when you're self-aware like you are and you know these are my strengths and write them down. And it could be one. It doesn't have to be, you know, a whole list of things that you're good at, right? And whatever those are, those are your strengths. And now try to figure out where you need to supplement. The, The challenge is some folks... When you think you're the smartest person in the room, it's a really lonely room to be in, right? It's being self-aware, identifying really what you're really good at, and then figuring out what you need and who do you need on your team. I always say, I am not, like with Richard Motion, we have a Navy SEAL team. I am not the smartest person in the room. Never want to be, right? Um, that's what the team is for, but together collectively we can do anything. Okay. Beautiful. Now, um, Dan, I'd like to get a more personal if possible. In fact, I'd like just to hop into a time machine together. We're going to go back. We're going to go back to, we'll say the seventies. All right. Going back to the seventies and you're going to get to go up to little Dana back then. And you're going to get to tell him all of the good, all of the bad, all the strengths and challenges and, and all of the, the fun times, the bad times, you're going to get to teach him everything that you know, in order to make his life bigger, badder, faster, more profitable, whatever version of success you've defined for yourself. He's got it. Okay. But if there was one thing you had to make sure he understood, what was it? Uh, If there was one thing I'd have to let him know to understand is that um, nothing is permanent and that um, attachment to things could, that's what leads to suffering in some ways. Right. So we get attached to materialistic things sometimes. Sometimes we get attached to, to, to people, right? Um, and, and with that becomes, there's, there's always going to be a, um, a separation with that, right? Um, so your favorite bike you had when you were nine, nine years old, right? That you, you don't have that anymore. Or maybe there's a relationship or, or you lost a loved one. You know, I lost a, a good friend of mine when I was 18 years old. And when you're 18, you're invincible. You don't think anything like that. You don't. You never really, at that point, most people don't have to um, have an understanding of what that is, right? When someone passes, um, and I think once you understand that that a, it's not permanent, and even when things or people move on, they're still always with you. That really helps. I w- I wish I knew that at my younger self because you just fall into this um, understanding of that, A, you need to attach yourself to everything um, and that everything is permanent. It's always going to be here. Right? It'll always be the same. Okay. Now, um, Dana, I believe that we learn the most in our life from our failures, not necessarily our successes. Because mm-hmm. when you succeed the first time you try something, you may not quite realize what happened. But if you fail, you got to take a look at it. You got to figure out what went wrong. You got to be able to move past it. And, you know, we were discussing this earlier. So I'd like to ask you, what do you consider your biggest failure in life? And what did you learn from it? My biggest failure in life? That's a great question. And I, I think up to the... I, I don't know. I think we. Um, I don't know if I've if I've had that yet, right? Because you can break that down in so many different ways. You could look at it from a relationship perspective. I know when I first started my company, um, my marriage suffered because I was a hundred 
percent in to that and i wasn't you know being uh, a father and, and being there because i was so focused on my company so you could take that aspect of it a lot of the businesses i talked about there were businesses that i tried that i just failed i just once again i wasn't following what i was really good at and my passion i was trying to follow the money right my dad always said that if you're passionate about something you never worry about money but if you do something just for the money the money will run out so I look at every day when I wake up as a blank canvas, knowing that there's opportunity to learn and that learning may come through failing at something, right? But if you look at it as failure, then it's always going to be that permanent mark, you know, as an F um, when you look at your report card of life. I try not to look at it that. I try to, whatever it was, and every day there's something I could say, oh, I, I, I could have done better. I should have done better. I could have improved. So I know that maybe not answering the question directly, because to me, there's that one thing I could say, oh, I, you know, I, I could have been a better friend or could have been a better parent, could have been a better husband, could have been a better person. I think it's collectively, we all go through these things on a daily basis. Are we self-aware of them, right? That's where the biggest failure is with anyone. If you're not self-aware, you're going to keep on repeating the pattern. Um, self-awareness helps us to create intention to change that pattern okay uh thank you for sharing that i absolutely agree with you there um on the flip side of things what is something you're working to improve on yourself today i i think one of the things that i'm really working on um and you have some great questions so one is, is staying focused you know i i grew up when i grew up they didn't they didn't know what add was or or all these things, right? So I am very the shiny object, right? Um, it, it takes a lot. I practice every day to stay focused on task. Um, I literally have sheets and sheets of notes and paper that every day there's something I take from the day that I wasn't able to get done. Um, I think that's one of the key things that I work on. And the most important thing I try to work on every day um, is – the intention and act of being kind, right? So there's being kind and then there's being nice, right? Nice is like, oh, he's nice to me. But kind is really the intention to help improve somebody by your actions of doing something. And I think in, in a really positive way. So that's one of the things that I really work on every single day is this whole concept of kindness. Because I personally feel kindness is our superpower, we're all different. We all have different skills, but we really all have this ability in us to be kind to ourselves, which is the most important thing, right? It's like being on an airplane and they say, put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you could take care of others. That's not a selfish thing. That's the only way you can help take care of others. So it's important to be kind to yourself first in order to help be kind to others. That's beautiful. All right, Dana, this has been a fantastic interview. Thank you so much. How do people find you? How do they find Ritual Motion? Where are you all at in social yep. media, please? So um, they can always find me through Ritual Motion. Um, so it's ritualmotion.com. Um, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn under Dana Paul. I'm on LinkedIn. Or my email, Dana at ritualmotion.com. And okay. I'd love for anybody to reach out any questions? It doesn't have to be about ritual motion. It could just be about anything that we chatted about today. Wonderful. All right. Now, as we wrap this up, do you have any final thoughts you want to share or anything I didn't ask you think we still need to cover? No, I think you did good. And, you know, I, I'll say this, right? I think what you're doing is really important because what a lot of people don't understand is um, entrepreneurism and how important it is, but most importantly, how obtainable it is. Right. It's it's not something just for folks that are, are, are maybe up there or you think you have to go to a certain school or have a certain education or come from a certain area of town like entrepreneurism it is in all of us. And I think when you create a platform like this, it allows people to see everyday people because that's all I am at the end of the day. That's all everybody is. We're all the same. Right. We're humans. But how they've taken what they're passionate about. And, and learned along the way to get them to where they are. So I want to thank you for producing a platform that allows people to do that. Well, thank you for that. And, and thank you so much for coming on. I genuinely do appreciate it, Dana. 
Yep. Thank you. All right. And for everybody else, I'm going to remind you all, don't be just a gamer, be a gamerpreneur.